Victor Davis Hansen spoke recently in Capitola, California, about his latest book, Ripples of Battle, how wars of the past still determine how we fight, how we live, and how we think. This lasts an hour, 15 minutes. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to the Capitola Book Cafe this evening. As a reminder to our audience, um, a listing of our Book Cafe's author series events can be found not only in our monthly newsletter, but also at our fabulous internet, internet site, capitolabookcafe.com. Tonight's guest is Victor David Hansen, a frequent speaker at the Capitola Book Cafe, who has returned in honor of his latest work, Ripples of Battle, how wars of the past still determine how we fight, how we live, and how we think, published by Doubleday. Victor David Hansen began his higher education right here in Santa Cruz and then moved on towards Stanford. He is currently a professor of classical studies at California State University, Fresno, and is a senior member of the Hoover Institute in War, Revolution, and Peace, a Stanford Policy Resource Center focusing on politics, economics, and international affairs. This learned and quite energetic historian has written over 170 articles and book reviews that focus on classical studies, agricultural issues, military history, and contemporary culture. His work appears frequently in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the International Herald Tribune, as well as the National Review. He is also the author of 13 books, including Carnage and Culture, and more recently, Mexifornia, in which he, as a fifth-generation Californian farmer and historian, personally explores the rising concerns of America's fluid borders and immigration's effect on American and Mexican states and individuals. Now Mr. Hansen has penned Ripples in Battle, Ripples of Battle, excuse me. Looking at three highly influential, yet often overlooked battles in three distinct wars, Ripples of Battle combines gifted storytelling with a search for the deeper effects of conflict. The human, military, and cultural effects of devastating losses on the battleground will resonate for centuries to come, manifested, for example, in a family's loss of a husband or a son, such as Mr. Hansen's own uncle, or in the profoundly altered direction of Socrates' philosophy, now a philosophy from a survivor of ghastly loss in the Peloponnesian War. With our own entry into a far-reaching, world-altering conflict since September 11th, we too are in the throes of a battle's ripple effect. With his extensive expertise on current policies and a respected status as a leading military historian, Victor David Hansen also weighs in on how the past may be shaping our future. Please welcome Victor David Hansen. Thank you. It was very kind of you. And I like, always like to come back to Santa Cruz, where I spent four tumultuous years as an undergraduate <laughs> at University of California, Santa Cruz, Cal College. Uh, Ripples of Battle is part of an ongoing effort. I've, I've spent most of my adult life to reclaim the value of military history. And I'm trying to resonate with an audience that the Greeks' idea of history is not just a recording of things in the past. That seems to be what history is evolving to, whether it's a history of the sitcom or a history of the footnote or history of the pencil or history of the bra, but recording or memory of things that were preeminent in the past, and that requires some critical distinction. In the, the Greek sense, whether we look at Herodotus or Thucydides or Polybius or Tacitus, it's wars and politics. So I wanted to write about war, but in a different way. Most military histories look at the strategic consequences of conflict or the tactical ramifications of the way battles work on an operational level. I was interested in how battles affect all of us for centuries. Because there's something strange about a battle if you think about it. You put, mostly until the late 20th century, you put males, young males, and you put them in a confined space and you give them for a few hours a license to kill. Those who survive, if they live on, that becomes one of the most momentous periods in their lives because time seems to accelerate. The stakes, after all, or for one's life. If they're wounded, of course, they're wounded for the rest of their life. If they're killed, as in the case of my namesake, who was killed at 23 at Sugarloaf Hill, 
for the next 60 years, a whole family went over that loss. And what would have been? What would have been if Victor Hansen had a farm? What would have been if he had have been there with his father? So battle seems to compress time. And it, all events in the past are not equal. And I think that it would be behoove us to look at the past and look at it in a different way. Let me just read from, I, maybe I could summarize that from the first chapter when I, I said it's, you see, men, not gods, are deliberately responsible for the dead of battle in a conscious effort to slay other humans, and not through mere carelessness or errors in judgment. In time, we can come to accept the deaths of loved ones if they fall into chasms or they die of infection less so when they know that their youthful bodies were torn apart by angry humans without help from nature. People forgive the ravages of water and flame, but less so Japanese, American, or German slayers. Battle again, so unlike nature, brings with it bothersome and nagging ideas of preventability, culpability, causation, and responsibility, all married to the lingering notions of what if and whose fault. And he, not it, did this. Anger, passion, revenge always erupt from battle. Remember the Alamo, the Maine, or Pearl Harbor inflames nations in a way that the far greater losses from polio, Hurricane Carla, or the Anchorage earthquake cannot. So battle is a great leveler of human aspiration when it most surely should not be. Stray bullets kill brave men and they miss cowards. They tear open great doctors to be and yet merely nick soldiers who have a criminal past pulverizing flesh when there is nothing to be gained and passing harmlessly by when the fate of whole nations is at stake. And that confusion, inexplicability, and deadliness have a tendency to rob us of the talented, inflate the mediocre, and ruin or improve the survivors, but always at least making young men who survive not forget what they've been through. I can't talk this evening about the, all of the three battles that I discuss in the book. I deliberately selected those that we sort of know less about. I didn't want to look at Normandy Beach again or the Battle of Marathon or, say, Gettysburg. But I looked at Okinawa and an obscure battle of Delium in 424 and Shiloh. And it's Shiloh that I'd like to speak about in a few minutes. But just to give you some example of the other two, Okinawa, we don't really think much about it. If you look at the latest Oxford Military Encyclopedia, Okinawa doesn't even deserve an entry. Guadalcanal, we... It's okay. Okinawa, actually, 100,000 Japanese soldiers died. 100,000 Okinawa civilians uh, were casualties, wounded, missing, or killed. 50,000 American casualties, 12,000 dead. All of this just three months before the end of World War II. Why don't we think about it? There was a series of ripples that occurred that sort of clouded our memory. Franklin Delano Roosevelt died in the middle of the campaign. The war in Europe was ended in May during the middle of the campaign. And there was something about it that didn't make sense. I mean, we we took this big island and then we dropped the bomb just two months after the end of the campaign as if we think that was unnecessary, but people who came, if you talk to them from Okinawa, are angry that we didn't drop it before. Why did 300,000 people die or were casualties when you had this weapon that could have stopped it? So it's a very, it's a very strange battle to look at. And then when I tried to interview survivors or talk about the literature that came out, some great literature came out of it. William Manchester, Goodbye Darkness, W.B. Sledge, with the old breed. And two things I think are very important for us in the, in the present period. If you want to learn how Americans or the West react to people who get in planes and fill them through with explosives and try to kill their enemy and themselves in the process, you would do no better than go back to Okinawa. That act of suicide murdering has a profound effect on the West when people want to kill so badly that they're willing to sacrifice their life in the process, it brings back a response out of Westerners. If you want to know where in the United States or where in our military practice we came up with the idea of body counts and not territory, go back to Okinawa. After the Americans scoured the entire island and declared it safe, they went back again because there were 8,000 Japanese that they had skipped and they went into holes, pulled them out, and killed them. 8,000 people, and that's where the whole idea of body counts arose. If you want to go back to the idea that Asian warriors were 
deemed by Westerners to be fanatic, go back to Okinawa. It's, it's the laboratory of suicide and military conflict. There were people who were suicide pilots, people who were suicide submariners, people who were suicide cruise boaters, people who were suicide human rockets in a, in a human rocket. There were people who were suicide infantrymen, suicide everywhere, and yet the Americans devised a method, brutal as it is, to deal with it. The idea that if Western people are willing to lose losses, they have the ability, the discipline, and the firepower and the technology to make life so awful for the people who would choose to die to kill them that they came up with a menu. And I think that it's, if you want to know why we were talking about daisy cutters, our bunker busters after 9-11, it's something to do with this image of a suicide murderer that has a profound ripple in the West. The other battle I looked at was Delium. 424, who ever heard of it? It was a border skirmish between, of all people, the Boeotians and the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War. And yet Athens at that particular time was going through the first real enlightenment. This was a city that had Pericles and Phidias and Euripides and Sophocles, Socrates. And this battle was fought a mere 50 miles from Athens, and it was a horrendous defeat for Athens. They lost the battle to the Boeotians, and people fled all the way back to the Acropolis. And it became a trauma in the Athenian collective memory that they had fled right on their borders. And the bodies that were lost were kept by the Boeotians as hostages and allowed to be putrid and rot for 17 days. And out of that horrible experience, believe it or not, a lot of very strange things happen. Our present play, Euripides Suppliants, is about uh, in some ways, the battle, Euripides resurrected the myth of the seven against Thebes, both to castigate the Thebans and also to talk about the justice of letting bodies rot under the sun. But the, the funny thing is that that play is the locus classicus for classical ideas about democracy. In some ways, if we didn't have that play, we would be impoverished about the ancient view of democracy. We wouldn't have that play if it hadn't been for this battle. Alcibiades with this battle. Unfortunately, he was very brave in his career took off as a 26-year-old cavalryman with unfortunate results for the next 20 because he earned capital at that battle, moral and military capital, and he led his city into disaster. Socrates was 46 years old. This is his third battle, three times in the corpus of Plato's works. Plato resonates throughout his work in the Laws and Republic about battle, and specifically Delium. If Socrates had been killed in this battle, Western civilization, as we know, it would not exist because Plato was only three or four years old at the time and would have never met him. And we know later Plato said he was looking at a career in politics or poetry. And there was also the tactical birth of what I would call articulation or the idea that battle was not just two phalanxes colliding, but in a echelon attacks, reserves, the use of cavalry, the whole precursor to Alexander the Great took place at this battle. I could go on and on, but I think you can see that if you look at a battle not as what did it do to affect the outcome of a war, or how many people fought how many people, but try to see individuals and see how that experience changed art and literature, you get a very Im different impression of military history. Which brings us to the third and the one I want to talk for a few minutes and I'll stop and, and I have questions. And that was this strange battle of Shiloh. We don't really hear not nearly as much about Shiloh, even we hear Cold Harbor, Antietam, Gettysburg, but in some ways Shiloh was a very critical battle. And although I'm not going to talk about it tactically or strategically, I'll just give you a brief idea that on April 6th and 7th, 1862, for maybe the one and only time of this young, at that time, young Civil War, the South really had a chance to defeat the North. Somehow, these disparate generals who were squabbling from different states without a, no nation of, a notion of nationhood had actually assembled 40,000 men under Generals Bragg and Boulevard and this Apollo on horseback, Albert Sidney Johnston. The reason I was attracted to this uh, battle is that besides my hero, William Tecumseh Sherman, my maternal grandmother was Georgia Wade Johnston, who claimed ancestry to Albert Sidney Johnston, her family from Alabama. So I grew up hearing in the morning that William uh, Tecumseh Sherman was a monster and Albert Sidney Johnston was a saint and they had both met at Shiloh. And I wanted, it's always been in my mind as well as the death of Victor Hansen in Okinawa. So I had a personal relationship in some ways with these battles. But in any case, when the battle was over, two and a half days later, the whole world took 
note because this was the first mass battle in some sense with rifled musketry and there were more casualties dead wounded and missing in, at Shiloh than all the battles in the history of the American Republic up to that time put together probably 24,000 casualties and at least almost 2,000 killed. Now this would be child's play compared to the wilderness or, or Antietam or Gettysburg, but at this period it was shocking. And what the South tried to do with this massive army was to go up the Tennessee River, reclaim the border states, and perhaps go into southern Ohio and threaten Cincinnati. And they almost did it because on the morning, Sunday, Sunday morning, they got this army. Nobody thought they could do it. Albert Sidney Johnson brought it within a few hundred uh, yards of the Union line, and nobody knew it was there. And they attacked at dawn, and they almost broke immediately the right side of the Union army. And what I'd like to do at this point is not talk about the tactics, but talk about how this battle affected four people who were there in a way that I think affects all of us in this room right now. Uh, I should say before we start, there was a lot of famous people here, two future presidents who I'm not going to talk about, Ulysses S. Grant and James Garfield fought there, two great explorers in, in American history, Henry Morton Stanton, Stanley, the African explorer, and John Wesley Powell, who founded, found, or at least recorded the Colorado River exploration. So there was a lot of people here. But one of them was William Tecumseh Sherman. And when the battle started at 5.30 in the morning, William Tecumseh Sherman was all through. Now, he was one of probably the most brilliant military mind in the history of American uh, military operations, but not at Shiloh that morning because he'd had a checkered career. He had resigned a few years earlier from the military. He'd gone out to California during the gold rush. He, everything he di did revealed his natural brilliance and his sterling character, and he failed. He failed at everything. He failed as a banker. He failed as a farmer. He failed as a shopkeeper. He finally went down to Louisiana on the outbreak of the war and had an academy, the future LSU. It was working, and the war broke out, and he had to leave. And then, it, due to his political connections, his wife, was connected with a very prominent legal family. He was given a command at Bull Run. He did pretty well, and he was given, after that, uh, command of the Western Theater, specifically to watch out for Kentucky and Tennessee. And he said something in fall of 1861 that ruined his career. He said, I think this war is going to take 200,000 men. And at that time, people were talking about one great battle that would end it. And he said, we can't win the war unless we we want 200,000, we need these men. And people thought he was crazy. Then he said that I, I'm depressed, uh, he had bad asthma, he resigned his commission. He had, I think what uh, the modern physician would call a mental breakdown, he might have been bipolar. In any case, he was all through and he didn't do anything for two months. And finally, through the, the effort of friends, he was given just one division, a raw Ohio division. He was just a brigadier general. He was one of many brigadier generals at the Battle of Shiloh. And it was just fate that before the battle, he thought of suicide, but he didn't want to embarrass his family. And when Albert Sidney Johnson and Braxton Bragg decided to destroy the Union Army, they hit William Tecumseh Sherman on the right side of the uh, line. And he had about 7,000 men, and he was faced with 20,000 people pushing him at once. And something happened. All of that experience that had been accumulated in his life came to focus right there. Unlike other commanders, he did not panic. He became emboldened. As minutes went on, he rushed to the front. He organized battalions. He had batteries of cannon placed strategically. He lost one horse. Fifteen minutes later, the second horse was shot out from on him. An hour later, a third horse was shot at. A bullet went through his hand. A bullet hit his leather strap on his chest. Bullets riddled his... Uh, hat. Everybody saw William Tecumseh Sherman trying to galvanize this crumbling right, uh, right flank of the human army. And when it was all said by noon, they did not crack and they bent but did not break. Grant met him early in the morning and said, Sher I never had to worry about Sherman. And when Sherman woke up the next two days later after the battle was over and he fought the very first seconds of Shiloh and the last seconds, he was a famous American. All, everything that had happened badly to him, the breakdown, the lock, last loss of command, the resignation was completely forgotten. Sherman was a man of the hour, and two mysterious things happened. One is Grant was discredited 
right wrongly I think but people thought that he was asleep or worse drunk and he didn't know that this massive army had reached his ar his own forces and he was temporarily relieved to command Sherman went to him and said they thought I was crazy once and uh, you gave me a chance to come back at this battle I think you should stay and this partnership was forged and unfortunately for the south out of that crucible of Shiloh Grant and Sherman worked like a team and for the next three and a half years had great trust as the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the West uh, worked in tandem and they created this strange strategy of holding the Southern Army of Northern Virginia fast between Richmond and Washington while Sherman went in the back and destroyed the material resources of the South. And that was an undeniable ripple that took place at Shiloh. The other thing is, Sherman had a very different reaction to Shiloh than Grant did. Grant wasn't really in the heat of battle, and that battle was won on the second day because Grant had 27,000 Union troops in various, within a 15-mile radius of the battle. And ap after the first losses of the first day, he saw that the way to defeat the South was to bring in reserves, bring in more manpower, bring in more material. And Grant's idea of fighting then was that this was a waging a war between two societies and the Union Army would always win because it had superior manpower. Sherman who was in the heat of battle and saw this first horrific result of musket, uh, rifled musketry came up with a different, a very different reaction and he wrote this again and again in his diary and to his wife that there had to be an alternative to sending young men head-on in the age of accurate weaponry and out of that idea he started to formulate a new morality of war, something that we, I think he's one of the most misunderstood people in American history, but he thought that it was not moral for a white slave-owning class, 3% to 4% of the South owned slaves, and they were not participating in the war, but they were sending young non-slave-owning people under the guise that they were protecting the sacred soil of the South. And he said there has to be a way not to repeat Shiloh, and except for one occasion later in his career he never did really engage in pitch battle again but he forged this idea and he's and he said it again and again it was a reaction to the bloodshed of Shiloh that of going down to the south and you know the great march from Atlanta to Savannah in December of 1864 November and December of 1864 and then into the Carolinas in which he lost only a hundred men he only killed 600 uh, southerners in the Georgia march but he uh, devastated the infrastructure of the South, $100 million of damage, primarily directed at state arsenals and the plantations of the wealthy. And so much so that when people in Georgia saw him coming, they said, hey, the people of Carolina started it, go over there, <laughs> we're tired of this war, which was a result of his thinking that originated out of Shiloh. Put Sherman dead on that first minute, and the South probably would have won that battle. Pert Sherman out of the battle and there would not have been a march through Georgia. And Pert Sherman without that experience of watching people blown apart and you wouldn't have had this slow genesis of this new way of making war. There was another, another key person, one of my favorites, I don't know why he, uh, he doesn't really warrant um, praise as a general, but he was a magnificent man and that was Albert Sidney Johnson. Six feet two, 200 pounds. He was the ranking military officer of the, of the United States Army when the war broke out. He was a commander of all Western forces. He'd fought against the Mormons. He was a, had sterling character. He was, had a series of financial reversals. Never any hint that he had broken the law or was dishonest. And uh, he had not done well at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, but he'd never really been in a pitch battle even though he was commander, more or less commander of all Confederate forces. This was before the rise of Robert E. Lee. And there was contemporaries who said he looked like a general. He talked like a general. He made these wonderful aphorisms. Men, tonight we will water our horses in the Tennessee River. Our men, enough of talking, it's time to fight. Just like Don Juan on the, on the deck of the Real at Lepanto, where he said the time for talking is over, the time for fighting is now. He had a wonderful education. He quoted Latin a lot. Well, in any case, he was the architect of this. And once the Southern Army was pounding at Sherman on the right side, they were making uh, some progress. But they came up to a center of resistance. And this was now famous, it's sort of like Seminary Ridge. It was called the Hornet's Nest. And rather than bypass it, 
And this often happens in military history where a piece of ground becomes emblematic or symbolic of a whole will of a people. Braxton Bragg and a series of Southern generals just kept throwing people at it in frontal assaults. And this uh, hornet's nest uh, was surrounded. It started to bend, but again, it did not break under General Prentiss. And the key thing to remember was the day was getting late. And the Southerners were evenly matched, 40,000, roughly against 40,000. They had surprise, they had momentum, but they had to push the Union Army into the Tennessee River before reinforcements came across because General Bell had 20,000 and Lew Wallace, as we'll see in a minute, had seven. And they lost a critical three to six hours there. And finally, Albert Sidney, Albert Sidney Johnson came over there at two o'clock and he said, we need the bayonet. And he got on his magnificent horse and he charged, Fire Eater was the name of the horse, he charged the hornet's nest and he went right through and he came back and he said, they didn't trip me up, men, go get them. And he fell out of the saddle. People thought he'd fainted. He had just dismissed his doctor who could have easily staunched the wound with a tourniquet to help Union prisoners. And he fell off his horse. Nobody knew what was wrong and he died in about 15 minutes. Turned out that his femur artery behind his knee had been hit and it, it had a very magnetic effect on people, whereas most people at Shiloh were being blown apart and terribly disfiguring wounds of modern warfare, Albert Sidney Johnson sort of went to sleep. Very handsome man, 60 years old. <laughs> Nobody could see the wound, there was no blood. He drifted off to sleep and people were shocked. This was two o'clock in the afternoon and they didn't know quite what to do. They said a Colonel Jackson had been killed. They did not want to ruin morale, but for about two hours, there was a stasis or a pause. And in that time, the Southerners later said that the hornet's nest was galvanized. Now, it would later be overwhelmed, but not till late in the afternoon. And out of this, this is what's fascinating, the Southerners post bellum, post facto, created this myth. Forget the fact that the hornet's nest should have been bypassed in the very first hours of the battle. Forget the fact that the South was going to be outnumbered the next day anyway. Forget the fact that there was a mediocrity of command. In the Southern mind, everything good as long as Albert Sidney Johnson, this Apollo on horseback, was alive, everything bad when he died. And if you look at the Battle of Shiloh today, there's a monument of victory hands is handed over to night and to death. Night being the day ended before the South could get to the Tennessee River and Albert Sidney Johnson died. And this was the creation of this mythology in the South of the so-called lost opportunity. We didn't lose because we didn't have industrial capacity. We didn't lose because we didn't have enough manpower. We didn't lose because we didn't have the better, we had the worst cause. We lost because of fluke. We were more patriotic, we were more courageous man to man. And it was a very powerful feeling in uh, the South. And I just want to read you a couple of things from contemporaries. One of them is the Texas legislature. Had the fatal shot which struck him down in the six not been fired, Grant and his forces would not have been destroyed. They would not have been captured before done. And Buell would have never crossed the Tennessee. General Johnson's death was a tremendous catastrophe. There are no words adequate to express my own conception of the immensity of the loss to our country. Sometimes, this is the Confederacy. Sometimes the hopes of millions of people depend on one head and one arm. The West perished with Albert Sidney Johnson. The Southern country followed. After the war was over, rather than admitting that the strife had ended because of either the bankruptcy of the cause, that it was tied in with slavery, but the resources were inadequate. The lost opportunity at Shiloh fed into the larger idea of the lost cause. And it had very pernicious effects, I think, for Southern cultural history for the next century. The inability to come to terms, not only that the South was outweighed by material uh, resources and manpower, but that generals like Grant and Sherman were better than, than Southern generals, or that people from Ohio and Michigan and Indian, Indiana were just as courageous as good Southern troops. But out of that inability to accept reality became this myth-making that had, as I said, a pernicious effect, and that too was a ripple of Albert Sidney Johnson's death at Shiloh. I want to turn to a, a happier note in some ways, about six miles from the battle, while all this is going on, there's a very flamboyant guy named Lou Wallace. 
He's 35 years old. He never went to West Point. He draws, he paints, he writes, he thinks he's a poet. He's very handsome. Everybody from West Point hates his guts. In the chaos of the first year, everybody remembered by state legislatures were being, you know, promoted. And this guy somehow ended up as a major general. He had a minor role at Fort Donaldson, which he magnified to all the press. The press loved him. And he's there with 7,000 men from Indiana. And he's there as a strategic reserve up a little bit farther north on the Tennessee River. And he's got a wonderful plan before the battle even starts. In the weeks before, he's created a special route of reinforcement called the Shung Pipe. He's communicated with another General Wallace uh, about a contingency plan that if the North gets attacked, he will be there within minutes. And he's very uh, flamboyant. The problem is nobody likes the guy. And Ulysses S. Grant does not want to work with him. When the battle starts out and, and Sherman's reeling and creating this myth of Uncle Billy from the, the, suicide, the potential suicide, <laughs> and Albert Sidney Johnson is rushing over to the hornet's nest, Lou Wallace from five to six to seven in the morning is raring to go. He's all ready to bring these 7,000 at the critical time and be the hero of the battle. Grant doesn't get up to Shiloh at 8.30 and passes him on a boat going upriver and says, we'll get to you. Nothing happens. Lou Wallace is waiting and waiting. Not till 11.30 in the morning does Lou Wallace get the word. And what does he do? Uh, he gets the word go to the right side and reinforce where Sherman is, but it's not written down. Grant, not even knowing about this alternate universe that exists in the mind of Lew Wallace, thinks he's gonna take the river route, which everybody goes back and forth along the river. Lew Wallace thinks that he means the Shunpike, his favorite road that he's worked at and corduroyed and already. So Lew Wallace takes off. He gets, the, the order was never written down, so it's gonna be a big moment in the history of uh, the Civil War for the next 40 years because there's no written record of Grant's actual directive. But Lew Wallace takes off and he makes wondrous progress and he's within a few thousand yards of the right side. But as we know now, Sherman was pushed back two miles. Lew Wallace is actually going to come around to the rear of this Confederate army. Now you can think that might be ludicrous or suicidal, but if you're Lew Wallace, you might also think that could save the entire Union cause on the first day by having a uh, movement to the rear of the unknown to the Confederates. Now people uh, afterwards said, well, the Confederates would have known or he would have been wiped out, but maybe not. But the problem was right when he got crossing a bridge, frantic messengers came from Grant and said, you took the, where are you doing? He says, I'm going to the right to reinforce Sherman. Sherman is all through. You took the wrong road. So rather than just let him come, they made him reverse and go all the way back, and then go all the way back, about a 16-mile round trip. And Lew Wallace, being Lew Wallace, just refused to turn the army and have the rear become the front. He made it make a complete cartwheel, took an hour to do. He insisted that all of his cannons, all of his proper order be maintained, and the result of it was he did not get to the battlefield till 7 o'clock in the evening. And by that time, the Union Army was not 40,000 men. It was 20,000. It was hiding under the cliffs and it was just about ready to be pushed into the river and all afternoon Grant was tearing his hair out where is my 7,000 men? The next morning of course Lew Wallace did come General Bell came across with 20,000 the Union Army that was down to 15 was now up to almost 50,000 the southerners were exhausted they counterattacked, pushed the south back and won but uh, after the battle was over of course all this recrimination was directed at Grant because people could come down on the Tennessee River. It was very easy and they could see this horrendous scene of these 24,000 people, almost like insects, crawling around the battlefield, destroyed, disfigured, dead everywhere. And there was an outcry of how did the South surprise us? And one of the proper scapegoats, of course, was Lew Wallace. We wouldn't have had this happen if Lew Wallace just had a paid attention. And what happened then is, of course, Lew Wallace being Lew Wallace went on the counterattack. He went to the press. Uh, Henry Halleck was appointed the new commander. He badmouthed Halleck. It got back to him. And before he, he, he knew what was happening, the three most powerful people in the Union Army, Halleck, Grant, and Sherman, either hated Lew Wallace or, weren't, or in case of Sherman, were, was not going to do anything about it. And he was demoted. He lost command. He finally ended up at the end of the war with a, a, def, a, a 
important command to defend Washington, but more or less his military career was over with. And for the next 40 years, he died in 1905, he was known as this what if person. This man at 35 who had ruined his career because he couldn't find the battlefield. Now he's, he went to the battlefield, he offered to draw maps and guides for the battlefield to show everybody that he actually had come in time and his road was superior and he had given no written orders. He begged Grant when Grant was dying in his memoirs to change his memoirs. Grant put a little footnote. But uh, one thing that Lew Wallace did do was he spoke and he wrote and he turned out to be quite a writer. Some of his novels were not very good. He wrote one about the fall of Constantinople, one of Tenochtitlan, but in 1880 he hit on something called Ben-Hur. And he wrote this novel. And the funny thing is, if you look at the novel, the novel is a thinly <laughs> illustrative metaphor for who else? Lou Wallace. Judah Ben-Hur is this energetic, charismatic young nobleman who it's not Grant who, who ruins his career, it's a proconsul or official named Gratus, who uh, <laughs> Lou Wallace is on, uh, Lou Wallace uh, misses the road, but Ben-Hur hits a roof tile, it hits Gratus, and then his rival, Masala, you can either say it's probably Henry Halleck, then tries to destroy Lou Wallace, uh, Lou Wallace dash Ben-Hur. Lou Wallace didn't have to go quite into the galleys, but he had a pretty hard time. And only through perseverance and religion, Lou Wallace found his God like Judah Ben-Hur did. He becomes rich and powerful. And the funny thing about Ben-Hur was the zeal about Shiloh not only made him write the novel to get even, but it gave him this idea that he needed to promote it. Lou Wallace spoke everywhere between 1880 and 1900. There were 20 thousand productions of Ben-Hur on the stage. Later there would be four movies after his death. Ben-Hur started to sell 750 a week, a thousand a week. In two years it was selling a million copies a year. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. It outpaced Uncle Tom's Cabin. In fact, it was the best selling book, not, fiction book in American history until Gone with the Wind. And it created this whole nexus between the drama, the novel, the movie, and popular culture and advertising. There were towns called Ben-Hur. There were mugs. There were books with advertisements for Ben-Hur. And if you follow what Lou Wallace was doing during this 20 years, it's actually it's the precursor of Star Wars or Terminator, this whole idea of novel or story or movie or play or advertising put into one. Lou Wallace was reliving uh, Shiloh again and again and again and again. And uh, he said, and just to give you an example of what a strange man he was. This is in, this is in 1885 where he's really the best-selling author in the history of American letters. By the way, Oliver Wendell Holmes or James Lowell and Cambridge, they don't want anything to do with this guy. Stilted prose thinly veiled Christian allegory. It's not highbrow literature, but to American people, it was really, for most people, the first time they ever thought that it was an acceptable thing to read fiction that was not religious. And it was religious message involved. So it really created the idea of an American frontier family or American average family reading literature, sort of the popular uh, pulp magazine or pulp bestseller. And he said, this is in 1885, Shiloh and its slanderers, Will the world ever acquit me of them? If I were guilty, I would not feel them so keenly. Ending by finding solace in Ben-Hur, I can bear it. I have a reputation in another sphere now to keep, that, keep me afloat. And then later in 1900, 38 years after the battle, when he's a worldwide celebrity, he says, the awful mystery known as the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing, he calls it Pittsburgh Landing, where he was, comes home more directly than to most of those engaged in. Oh, the lies, the lies that were told me about me, to make me the scapegoat, to bear off the criminal mistakes of others. Think of what I suffered. His, all of his letters are just filled with that. Shiloh, in other words, is responsible, I think, for Ben-Hur, not just the plot, but the zeal to promote it. And Ben-Hur is really the first example in American letters of a phenomenon that we all know and recognize today of the popular novel, popular movie, popular icon of popular culture. I'd like to uh, give you one more example there was a fourth person there, 
and he was a very different man than, than Lew Wallace. As the Union Army was being pushed into the Tennessee River, and it was getting late, one man on the southern side, and only one man, realized what was happening. Lew Wallace had, was pulling in, but he hadn't quite gotten there yet. Albert Sidney Johnson was dead, Sherman was backpedaling, but there was a lowly colonel named Nathan Bedford Forrest, probably the most brilliant military commander on both sides in the entire war, but he was a colonel, and he was sort of an odious man. He'd made a fortune in slave trading. He was not an aristocrat at all. He was from the lower classes of the South. People associated slave trading with a lack of breeding. He was functionally, I don't think he was literate. He could barely write or read. He was supposed to guard a small river. But just as Shiloh had turned a suicide into a hero or turned a majestic man into the South's excuse for losing or just as they turned a 35-year-old major general into the best-selling um, novelist of the 19th century, Shiloh in three incidents changed this lowly colonel into one of the most uh, important figures in American history. First thing that happened is he didn't do what he was supposed to. He left Lick Creek where he was guarding uh, horses in the flank of the, the Southern Army and he went right into the hornet's nest. Right in on horses, his men right, red, uh, rode right into the fire and everybody saw it. And they survived and they were partly instrumental for finally cracking the hornet's nest. And then at six o'clock in the evening, he had this mind that was amazing. He sized up the entire battle and he said, there's only 10 or 15,000 of these Union soldiers left. We still have the nucleus of our army that was 35, 30,000 men who were pushing. They were gonna push them right off the cliff into the Tennessee River. Lew Wallace was still pulling in. Bull was, Buell was on the other side of the river. He said, it's now or never. If we beat these people and destroy them, the reinforcements won't even come across. They will not throw good men after bad. And he stalked the battlefield at 7, at 8, at 9, at 10, at 1, at 2, at 3, at 4 in the morning. He went to General Polk. He tried to get the entire Southern command who was convinced they won this wonderful victory. They brought this magnificent army undetected. They would really battered the North. And the next morning, they, all they would have to do was just push these few remnants. And this lowly colonel who had terrible grammar, couldn't read, was trying to get the aristocratic, aristocratic class of Beauregard and the successors to Johnson to do something, and they did nothing. And the next morning, Nathan Bedford Forrest alone realized the battle was over because when 27,000 fresh men joined the remnants of the Northern Army, they had a larger and fresher force and they just plowed right back into the South and routed them. But there was a third incident that changed his life and changed our own lives here tonight. And one of them was that in the final rear guard action as the Southern Army was leaving the battlefield on the third day, which the, war, the battle was over, but they were leaving the battlefield, Nathan Bedford Forrest took it upon himself to ensure that the army was not pursued. If the North had have just pursued this army, they could have destroyed it. But they were so shattered psychologically and there was so much mix up and Grant was so unsure of what had happened that they didn't pursue it. One man at the first second of the battle, Sherman, was now of course puffed up and he was the only man pursuing. And as he went after the uh, Southern army, he had a whole brigade and Nathan Bedford Forrest was the only person between him and the Southern Army. And Nathan Bedford Forrest, being Nathan Bedford Forrest, charged straight into Sherman with about 300 men. Sherman had three times that number. The first line fled, second line fled, Forrest kept charging. He looked around and all of his fellow Tennesseans were gone. And he was all, all of a sudden right in the middle of several dozen Union soldiers and they were yelling, kill him kill him, knock him off, and one ran up and shot him in the hip. The bullet went through his hip and lodged right next to his spine and his leg went numb. His horse was hit and was bleeding to death. We don't know if this is true. I say we don't know this is true. I doubt it could be true, but everybody who was an eyewitness at the battle said it was true. He picked up about a 140 pound slight Union soldier with one hand, put him in front as a human shield and ran back out. And as he ran off, it was almost like he was Achilles at the battlefield before Troy. He threw him down and he rode off into his destiny. And Northerners and Southerners said, who is this man that we can't even kill with, with puny weapons like guns? 
after the battle was over, just think if there was dissension on the northern side, there was outcry in the south because the battle had been so miraculously fortunate for them to get this army undetected, to fight the first day, almost win, and they had actually sent messengers back at the night, Sunday night, saying we've won the battle, and then to lose Albert Sidney Johnson and to lose this battle and to close down the Western Theater. Somebody had to pay, and there became this mutual re recrimination. It was Beauregard's fault. No, it was Bragg's fault. No, it was Hardy's fault. There was one person who was nobody's fault. Everybody realized there had been one man, and one man alone, Nathan Bedford Forrest, who had not only seen what was wrong, had advocated the solution, and had shown himself to be the bravest man on either side of the battlefield. He was quickly made brigadier uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest and given command in the Tennessee Theater. And for the next three years, he was quickly came, in, in the words of William Tecumseh Sherman, that devil Forrest. And he embodied, embodied the lightning mobile raids of Southern cavalry. He tied down over 10,000 Union troops that could not stop him. He almost crippled the assault on Atlanta. And unlike the rest of the Southerners, he never surrendered. He never surrendered to a Union army. He just said, men, I'm a going home. And he broke up and he went back to the South. In the post-bellum reconstruction, the myth-making of the lost opportunity fed into Nathan Bedford Forrest, where the aristocratic class, the slave-owning class, had lost, and many, much of it had been decimated. There was one man, a populist, who embodied the average working Southerner, who never lost and was defiant and became a popular hero. And During the difficult period of Reconstruction, think of it, in 1866 and 1867, there was a suspension of habeas corpus in Tennessee. There were people raud raiding and rousting out Republicans and black, freed blacks, and nobody embodied this defiant recalcitrance better than Nathan Bedford Forrest, the undefeated man who at Shiloh, almost single-handedly on a horse, had, uh, had kept the Southern cause al alive. And look what he said. This is in uh, 1867 with the foundation of the Ku Klux Klan. Ku Klux Klan would have been like any other failed white group. The Order of the White Camellia, there was a pale face. There's a whole bunch of Southern groups that were trying to recapture Southern pride through racial solidarity and resentment at freed blacks. They were all pretty much a failure. But one of them, the Ku Klux, which is the Greek word Ku Klux, circle, this Klan, uh, people had rumored they offered it to Robert E. Lee. That's not been substantiated. And Lee said, ask Forrest. He's the man that can lead men. But there was one man that everybody thought embodied the bitterness and the legitimate grievances of the Southern poor. This particular group were not discredited aristocrats. This particular group were poor white people who created this myth that they couldn't survive with these uppity blacks and northern scallywags and carpetbaggers who had deliberately ruined and kept them down. And this particular white supremacist group was quite different than the other ones. It didn't have any of the pretensions of the aristocracy or the plantation class. And more importantly, it had this new image that people were ghosts and they were cavalrymen. And who better to be emblematic of the southern cavalrymen but this man who was a hero of Shiloh. And so people put on sheets and they got on horses and they rode at night just as they were coming out of the graves to embody the, the lost people at Shiloh and other battles. And, and look, what, look what he said. This is at a time when there's no habeas corpus and there's thousands of Union troops in the South. And he said, I can assure you, fellow citizens, and he wrote this to a newspaper, I, for one, do not want any more war. I've seen it in all its phases, and believe me when I say that I don't want to see any more bloodshed, nor do I want to see any Negroes armed to shoot down white men. If they bring this war upon us, there is one thing I will tell you, that I shall not shoot any Negroes so long as I can see a white radical to shoot, for it is the radicals who are to blame for bringing this war on. But if they send the black men to hunt the Confederate soldiers whom they call the Ku Klux, then I say to you, go out and shoot the radicals. If they do not want to inaugurate another civil war, the sooner it comes, the better that we may know who, what to do. So he was absolutely defiant. Turned out that he actually was trying to, to work with Northerners to create a business. He lost all of his fortune. He was poor. 
but to the Southerners, he was he galvanized what would have been just another white supremacist group that probably wouldn't have had much success. But there was something about the Ku Klux Klan that appealed to the populist strain in the South, and this man, and this man alone had the history and the energy and the anger and the venomance to make it into something that would plague American life for the next century. Because the secret of the Ku Klux Klan wasn't that it was racist. There was a lot of other racist organizations. And it wasn't that it was violent. There was a lot of other violent organizations. But it had this myth that it appealed not to the wealthy, but to people who were victims and poor and were the victims of northern capitalists and northern industrialists. And Nathan Bedford Forrest saw that. And he played on it. And uh, he was the spiritual for literally the create the creator in some sense of the Ku Klux Klan. That career started at Shiloh. Let me just try to r conclude what I was trying to do in this book. And that was to look at battle and to s say, yes, they, yes, wars have strategic consequences. Yes, there is an art of warfare that's, that is tactics, but there's also something different. There's something about time that is compressed. There's something about lives on the line that create impressions, mentalities, ideologies, experiences that galvanize people for the rest of their life, either the survivors or the family of the survivors. I finished with an example of something that I know that reviewers have seen as quite controversial. Uh, although the book had very little on 9-11, I did have five pages on it. And I suggested that just as Delium and Okinawa and Shiloh had ripples, so would 9-11. And whatever your own feelings are on it, I do think that many of our ideas about war and peace and culture were changed on 9-11. Um, if, I don't know quite, there's a hierarchy of battle. I don't know quite why one battle becomes more important than the other. I know strategy plays a role. I understand Normandy Beach is important because of that. I understand that Verdun, the number of people who are killed, but there's other strange factors as well. One of them, perhaps, you take Teddy Roosevelt away from San Juan Hill, nobody knows about it. More people know that Cervantes fought at Lepanto than what Lepanto was. 215 people were killed at Little Bighorn. One million were killed in the siege of Leningrad for 900 days. There were more books written last year on Little Bighorn than Leningrad. So there's a capriciousness, an unfairness that gives weight to particular battles and not others. And so 9-11 is, we in Fresno, I live about 30 miles outside on a farm, we have two skyscrapers, sort of. And on any given day, there are 3,000 people, I think, that can work in those. Had those two buildings been leveled and 3,000 Fresno, Fresnans killed, terrible to even think about it, it would not have the same repercussions on American culture and life. This was... 20 acres, almost two kilotons of destructive force in the nation's financial capital, in the nation's artistic capital, in the nation's literary capital. People who write our books, people who write our poems, people who dictate what our portfolios are going to look like, people who craft the Federal Reserve, all of these people were either involved or could see this happen. And this will have ripples, and same thing with the Pentagon, that will emanate for generations. I think it will change something about art, I'm not sure that if anybody takes a piece of metal and twists it anymore and says that that's art, it will still have the same resonance as before. It will make a seriousness about literature that we may have, uh, have lost. A lot of ideologies, and here I think I probably would admit that most of you wouldn't agree with me, but I think there had been a slumber in American life, and we had certain comfortable beliefs about all cultures might be equal. After 9-11, we saw that the Taliban were fascistic, they killed homosexuals, they killed women, they were a completely different culture, and not just a different culture, but a subordinate culture in the sense that they were, if there is an objective standard, which I believe there is, it allows us to make a judgment, they were not the same as, as Americans. It also, I think, shattered ideas of pacifism, that if the great promise of the Enlightenment was if we could all just be educated and extend education and the opportunities of education, then as reasonable people we could agree, and there is not necessarily evil in the world. And yet, we saw that Osama bin Laden was wealthy, and that the United States had worked with Muslims in Kosovo, in Bosnia, in Somalia, in Kuwait, 
And so the old question, what do we do to deserve that, became to many of us absurd to even ask. There was the idea of moral equivalence. Is it the same to go after people in a time of war than to suffer casualties in a time of peace? All of these things were brought onto the table by 9-11. All of Americans are going to disagree about the particular administrations. I think most of us pretty much had an idea of, of prosperity, glibness, effectiveness with the economy with Clinton, sort of inarticulate Bush. We really hadn't made an impression. We were all upset, pro or con, about Florida. But whatever we think about, there will be 9-11 will be a dividing line. For those who are critical of the president, you will think that under Clinton, we were multilateral. The Europeans liked us. Now we're cowboys and unilateral. If you support the president and the, and the reaction to 9-11, you will think that, no, there was a series of Cobar Towers, bo bombings of embassies, bombings in Lebanon, bombings in y Yemen, first world trade, that it create, created a dangerous complicity, or complacency, I should say, excuse me, and that uh, we had lost the classical idea, what the Greeks would call deterrence, and that now we're slowly regaining it, as bitter and, and, and brutal as that can be. Whatever your political views, I think 9-11 then, will turn out to be just as important as Shiloh. And I would like to conclude this evening just by reading the last page of the book. But if history demonstrates that Lexington and Concord, Fort Sumner and Pearl Harbor, all turned America into, different, into a different nation in a matter of minutes, then why should we be any less immune from the far greater bloodletting on September 11th? If our understanding of Greek tragedy Greek art, philosophy, politics, and war were changed by a relatively obscure battle at Delium, then why would not the destruction of the World Trade Center and the bombing of the Pentagon not similarly, similarly alter American culture? The Athenian 5th century was ushered in by the defeat of Xerxes, but only after the destruction of the first Parthenon, the desolation of Athens itself, the Persian effort to destroy or absorb Hellenic civilization, and the miraculously Greek counter-response at Salamis. Millions of the anonymous have had their lives altered in ways we cannot grasp for centuries as a single battle with all its youth, confined spaces, and dreadful killing insidiously warps the memory of the friends and the family of the fallen, twists the thoughts and the aspirations of the veterans of the ordeal, and abruptly ends the accomplishments of the dead. In that sense, the ripples of battle are also immune from, and they care little for what people like us write and read in or outside the dominant West. They simply wash up on us all as we speak and in ways that we cannot fully be, know be known until centuries after we are gone. Thank you. I'd be happy to entertain a couple of questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for <coughs> your insightful comments and thanks. <clears throat> I have some questions on, do uh, you see throughout history that there is any common thread that you see through battles and uh, wars and things uh, throughout history that kind of galvanizes us together you know, today? And uh, what do you see beyond that? How do we as, uh, as people go, far, go farther beyond that to uh, try to Eliminate these future, these things in the future. What do we study? What do we yeah, what do we I'm, for the future? Well, with out maybe running the risk of being run out by all of you into the parking lot. <laughs> I believe that human nature is constant. Thucydides reminded us of that, and it's like water; it doesn't change. The pump changes. The delivery system changes. But there's always going to be evil in the world, and what creates deterrence and allows innocent people not to end up like the people in the Balkans and Rwanda or the Hutus. It's not the, the utopian idea you can eliminate war, but the realistic and pragmatic idea that you have to have military force to prevent killers from killing the innocent. I know that's unpopular today. So most of what I saw after 9-11, if I look back through history, it's mythological. Wars are ubiquitous. Plato said they're more common than peace. Heraclitus said they're the father of us all. Um, we're not at a war with, against terror, no more than we were at war against Falkwolf 190s or the Bismarck. We're at war against a method, 
and throughout history, people who have employed terror, and there's time-honored uh, methods to counteract it that involve the people who fund it and the people who allow sanctuary and the people who benefit by it. Um, I wish I could say that war is the worst of all human experiences, but unfortunately in the 20th century, combined Mao and Stalin and Hitler killed more people away from the battlefield than even were lost in this worst of all centuries. More people were killed in Iraq and after Iraq than the three weeks of actual so-called war. So war is a moral or it's amoral. It has no morality unless you look at the moral landscape that surrounds it. What's it waged for? How many people are lost? How is it conducted? What are the ultimate ramifications? So there are such things, as we say in Latin, a just war. But uh, I'm afraid that every time somebody talks about ending war or turning a war over to a world peacekeeper or a world policeman, people in the Balkans or in Africa get killed in the process. Talk, talk, die, die. Thank you. Um, my question is also on Sherman, because in your other book you uh, also give an excellent uh, analysis of his work. And his success doesn't translate into later military training. I mean, it seems like we go back and have these same types of wars, World War I being, you know, a terrible example. It can't be learned. I mean, it, we have to, it's, we're doomed to learn these uh, military successes over and over. Well, for example, if you were William Tecumseh Sherman, you looked at Vietnam, for example. He would say it makes no sense in the world to bomb peasants in the South. Forget what your position was on the, on the war. Forget what your position was on communism versus the Cold War. Just forget all of that. Just say that this is force A and this is force B. If you wanted to win that war, Sherman would say, then you march into Hanoi and you kill the people who were responsible for sending poor, uneducated peasants to the South. And you destroy the infrastructure of that war. But what we did was we bombed more than we did in World War II and we killed innocent civilians because we were afraid of drawing the Chinese and Russians by strategically bombing infrastructure or killing the cadre that, that fueled it. So, yes, I think you're right. But the problem with Sherman's theory is that in a liberal consensual society with pretenses to the Enlightenment, then it's very hard to suggest to people. And you know that I'm, I think you'll find that you believe me because if you mention the word Sherman today, people get furious. He's a terrorist. He's a barn burner. You mentioned Grant. I mean, you look at Grant, I mean, Cold Harbor, that was butchery in its par excellence. But when he mentions Sherman, it's too nuanced. It's too, it's too hard to communicate that it's a moral act to attack the people who are fueling a war and to save the innocent lives of the people who have to fight it. I've spent most of the last five years when I speak defending William Tecumseh Sherman even in the South, which is a suicidal thing to do. And uh, I learned at an early age from my own grandmother, Georgia Wade Johnston, that if it's between Albert Sidney Johnson, who did nothing, and William Tecumseh Sherman, who saved the Union, she'll take Albert Sidney Johnson, her forerunner, any day of the week. So it's just a hard message to get across, that it's not an amoral thing to attack the plantation of somebody who fuels succession. It's a much more moral thing to do that than to kill an 18-year-old kid who doesn't own any slaves. Thank you. Um, people talk about winning the war of ideas. Yes. In addition to destroying the enemy with war, do you see anything in history that shows you strategies for winning the war of ideas that have been effective? Yes. Well, yes, I do. I mean, people said that Reconstruction would never work and that we would never be united. But I think there were people in the North, reasonable people, Lincoln was the best example, that realized that the South really didn't have a deep racial hatred, but it had been hijacked by a secessionist class, which is the wealthiest class in the history of civilization were the plantationists. And they had polluted the entire culture and that that could be dealt with rather than just condemning a whole society for the, collectively. And so there was an effort to reach out, and it took a century. The same thing with Germany. We didn't believe really Americans, although we talked about it. When the war was over, we didn't believe the society that gave us Goethe, for example, was evil. We believed it had been hijacked. And I think that's what we're trying to do in Iraq. We don't believe that all of the Iraqis wanted to go into Iran or Kuwait and rape and pillage, although thousands of them did. We believe that they had been hijacked, that societies, you, all, all of us get 
various periods in our history can go collectively mad. And the only, the sad thing about it is, you have to have the order right. You can't convince a society that they've gone down the wrong path without first defeating them and again at the risk of being run into the parking lot, humiliating them. You can't go in to rebuild Japan until everybody in Japan knows that the way of the militarist leads to oblivion. You can't go into Germany and rebuild democracy until people really believe that Nazism gave them this misery. And in postmodern warfare, that which we encounter, when day two of the war we were worried about killing the Iraqi Baathists who were butchers and mass murderers, it's very hard to create society when they're still there and they haven't felt they were defeated and killed. It's almost as if history teaches us that the ease of reconstruction is in direct proportion to the amount of damage inflicted on the enemy. That's very hard for a liberal, humane society in a postmodern era like our own. In fact, if you said the problem in Iraq right now is the fourth division, the fourth mechanized division did not barrel down from Turkey right into Tikrit as planned and just obliterate those Baathists, and then it would have been easier. Nobody would believe you, but I think that history would. Yes, let's have a five minutes, a couple more. Couple more. Uh, yes. I have a question about uh, terrorism. For instance, the Maoists in Nepal. Yes. Don't you believe they're doing the same thing? They're destroying the infrastructure of the country slowly but surely by executing teachers, people who are educated. We saw this in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. We've seen it in a lot of countries, Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. Tamil where basically they're doing what Sherman was thinking. He probably was the only one. I, that was a, quite an insight when I read that part of your book yeah. about but well, you see that, don't we, in, in some of these other situations that I have? I do, but I can see your point, but you got to remember that Sherman, uh, Southern observers of his march said there were three rapes. I know that there were bummers and people who destroyed and burned plantations, but we don't have a lot of evidence that the Union Army, these were mostly four regiments, four corps from Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and Iowa who were homestead farmers. That's why they were so good. But we don't have this information that they went around and killed and raped and plundered. So I'm not sure that they're comparable with the people in Cambodia where it was a deliberate policy to kill civilians. Sherman would have probably objected vehemently to Curtis LeMay's bombing on March 11th of Tokyo. LeMay said, if a civilian is in a house in Tokyo and he's helped he's helping building a propeller, then he's the enemy that's responsible for the killing in China and the Philippines, and we're gonna not only beat him, we're gonna beat him so badly that the cinders are going to, to glow. And I think Sherman would have said that's too indiscriminate. You, he might be there, but the guy next door might not be. So Sherman was selective, and he thought that the point was to create dissension among the enemy by visibly demonstrating that some people were paying for their sins and others were not, although, if, you, can, you make a good point that the South, the economy, which was based on plantation cotton growing, suffered enormously, and that hurt poor people. But that was not, I don't think, the intent necessarily of Sherman. We have uh, two more in the back. Yeah, I saw your book notes on your book, uh, Mexi, Mexi Mexifornia. Mexifornia. Yes. Anyway, it was really good. Question for you. Had our uh, leadership read your book, prior to us going into our Iraq, what do you think might have been done different? Because right now it's turning out to be a mess. Well, the question is, what would be different? Um, Again, I guess I'm a historian that looks at long, and I try not to read the ebb and flow of the day. And what I look at is this, is that if I had have woken up on September 11th, and I don't forget what your politics are, whether it was right to go in Afghanistan or Iraq, but let's just say militarily. If I had have woken up on September 12th and I had said, in the next 24 months, the United States military is going to remove the Taliban and Saddam Hussein and try to implant consensual governments, and 50 million people will be free of that fascistic country. And in the process, we're not going to suffer another, another terrorist attack of the magnitude of 9-11. And Osama bin Laden is going to be in a cave. And Al-Qaeda is going to be on the run. And we're going to lose 300 American soldiers, tragic as that is. I wouldn't have believed it. 
So what I'm trying to do is look at the long term and vis-a-vis -vis the... Re if you look at 1946 in Germany, this is a hot topic now, but people forget that there was absolute killing and p plundering by Poles coming into Germany and Germans who were being ethnically cleansed and starvation. It was an ungodly mess. This is a year after the Reconstruction in a European country. I know that everybody wants the UN, but the UN went into the Balkans in 1991 and said they were going to solve that. 250,000 people. What I'm worried about is, I'm worried about death, but I was more worried about the non-fighting that resulted in a quarter million dead in the Balkans, why people talked about utopian pacifism. If you want to be a historian, I would say it was, it's a more dangerous thing to be in France in August than it is in the Sunni Triangle. Because one of the results of a whole society that believes it's the state's responsibility either to provide air conditioning or to watch out for elderly people while you're at the beach was mass death of the type we never experience in Fresno when it gets up to 110. Because we all know where our grandparents are and we rush over there and the state tries to have uh, alerts and there's f fans and air conditionings at Home Depot. We don't do that. And yet we're considered a less moral people. So it's much more dangerous, I think, in August in France or in the Balkans than it is in the Sunni Triangle. <laughs> One more question, and somebody, yes. Hi. Um, I think you're a fascinating historian, and I find arguments about Sherman, you know, really, really interesting and compelling. But I wonder, I mean, listening to you talk about 9-11, I wonder if you're so close to and thinking about war so much that you've accepted, and you, the only alternatives you see is a someone who's going overboard like Grant compared to someone who's trying to be moderate in deal, you know, less violently like Sherman in a way. Because, I mean, to talk about us being asleep at the wheel in 9-11 and sort of buys into all of our government's, you know, Bush's excuses, which he doesn't want analyzed in any way and won't allow investigation into. It's like, have you, do you take into account things like, you know, the Project for a New American Century in which they were just like waiting to come to power and they talked about another, uh, Pearl Harbor, like, it'd be a good thing that would allow them to, like, basically march across the world and start, you know. Well, I know that people for the next 50 years are going to argue that because they haven't, they haven't stopped arguing about Pearl Harbor. The great revisionist argument about Pearl Harbor is FDR deliberately allowed laxity so we could find an excuse to get into this war. We're still arguing about that. There was a book on it last year again. So I know that there will be people. What? I mean, there wasn't a war happening. You know, this Pearl Harbor was to, to start, you know, if they were complicit or allowed it, the war began there. Yes. You know, whereas with World War II, it was going and, you know, Roosevelt well, wanted to get in, arguably. I would beg to differ because I would suggest to you before Iraq, if you look at the precursors of war in American history, I just read some, Lexington and Concord or Fort Sumner or the sinking of the Lusitania, or Pearl Harbor, collect, uh, individually they did not total 3,000 people murdered and they weren't on the continental United States. So that was a psychological and material blow that we've never had in our history. Now we can argue about whether there were al Qaeda up in Kurdistan, what Abdul Nadal was, Abu Abbas, all these terrorists. You can argue about what were the precursors. Myself, I never made the argument on WMD. I made the argument on one thing and that was we had been at war with Iraq in 1991 and we had an armistice. And after an armistice, you do not spend $20 billion and have 12 years of occupying a sovereign nation's airspace. We'd flown 350,000 sorties to prevent, not to get oil, but to prevent a holocaust of the Shiites and the Kurds. So by any classical definitions, we were at war with Iraq. And after 9-11, the decision was made whether you agree or disagree, that you had no margin of error and it was time to finish it. And we did. And whether that was right or wrong, we'll have to wait and see and historians will have to sort it out. I probably will be very unpopular and I know that public opinion is swaying, but I think that it will turn out to be a landmark event. And I think that there's not, we didn't go in there for oil, just like we didn't go in for oil in Haiti. We didn't go in for oil in Milosevic. I'll just finish by saying that when I was a student at Cal, uh, UC Santa Cruz, the dream was always, let's support national liberation. Let's not go in and support fascistic cold warriors. And I look at what we've done. We got rid of Noriega, a fascist. We got rid of Milosevic, a fascist. We got rid of the Taliban, a fascist. 
and I got, we got rid of Saddam Hussein, a fascist, and I can't shed any tears about any of them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Victor Davis Hansen's books include Carnage and Culture, Mexifornia, and his latest, Ripples of Battle. The publisher's website is randomhouse.com slash doubleday. This fall is Book TV's fifth anniversary, bringing you nonfiction authors...